Welcome to edition 105 or 105, depending on which way you like that, of our Killer No Filler <laughs> podcast with me, Rachel Fairburn, and Kerry pritchard McLean. Just before we start, we'll do our usual disclaimer. This isn't hero worship. We do this podcast because we have mutual interest in serial killers. And as long as we are doing this podcast, it stops us from writing to them in prison. I was reading that along that coaster. Oh, so we have some... They all kill an overfill of coasters. <laughs> <laughs> we have some coasters in front of us. And I was reading along the, the hero worship as you did it, which was lovely. It's like, um, you know, you go to like a sing-along edition of The Great Showman. Oh, well, I mean, if you're into that kind of thing, yeah. Uh, well, obviously I would love something like that. I once saw someone... <laughs> I'm already getting off topic. So basically there was this guy... I used to do these nights in, um, in Preston. Do you, did you ever do the... Carova bar. In- I, I heard of it. I never did it. Yeah. So I used to host it every like two weeks and they had all sorts of like m- mad wild acts on. Some were absolutely brilliant, some were terrible. Uh, there's one guy who was like, uh, I remember him <laughs> doing a song. He's like, oh, this, this was all about my uh, ex-girlfriend, Vicky, and then just belched into the microphone. And But, but by mistake, like mid-sentence, he's like, <laughs> I want you back, Vicky. Um, and he was like 19. He shouldn't have been acting like he was oh, like four divorces no. in. Anyway, there was a really great guy called Chris and they uh, would sort of, they play a ukulele and I think they played the saw as well. They're really brilliant and talented and very like alternative. And I think I used to follow them on Twitter or I saw them on Twitter and, uh, uh, you know, somebody doesn't really tweet, but you look at their at and their at was like really disappointed, went to the greatest showman sing along and nobody else was <laughs> singing along. And actually everyone was staring at me quite a bit because I was joining in. But I thought, what a beautiful soul to go to a greatest showman yeah. and then complain to the venue that the other people weren't. Well, if, sing- of- if it says sing along, sing along. Yeah. Join in. That's an order. Well, yeah. I- so I hate things like that. Like, I'm not much of a, a joiner in <laughs> but, well, I'm not, but I wouldn't go to something and then not join it. Oh, yeah, I think you'd get involved. Do you know what I mean? Or, or I'd just not go. Yeah. You know, like, I don't like pantomimes. I, I find them fundamentally embarrassing. <laughs> Even as a child, I found them embarrassing. <laughs> and and I, I, remember, I must have said this before, I, there was a pantomime that went to school and we used to go every year. And one year, I, I had quite a lot of... Um, teeth out because we were having a brace and I had, I had more teeth than I needed my teeth were healthy before you all fucking start and, no uh, one's starting well they will <laughs> and I remember I'd had like two teeth out getting ready to have this brace and because of, of the taking it you know because everything's connected I got really bad earache and I couldn't go to the pantomime and I just thought this is the best day ever I've got a sore mouth and a bad <laughs> ear but I don't have to go to the pantomime yo yo I hate it. it's so embarrassing like oh he's behind you I love it. I love panto. My dream is to write a panto. I'd love to be in a panto. Don't get me wrong, I would be in one. If yeah, the offer is on go. the table, here I would absolutely be in one. Don't you know, though, that all the comedians we know who are in pantos are all like, oh, it's nearly December. Yeah, they love it, don't they? They love it, yeah. Whereas Steve Royal. Steve Royal, yeah. Jared Christmas. Oh, Jared Christmas. Yeah, Jared Christmas. Phil is, Walker. Yeah. They always really look forward to Christmas because they have an absolutely great time. Vicky Stone writes them as well and is in them. Interesting. Yeah, well, she's really talented, isn't she? Really musical. So, yeah, there you go, Panto. Wow. Yeah, so if the offer is there, <laughs> I will do it. Uh, but I won't respect the audience, but that's fine. <laughs> anyway, uh, blow the name with that. Happy New Year. Hope you had yeah. a nice Christmas 2024. and New Year. 2024. You're thrilled to be saying that, aren't you? Yeah, I got it right before, 2024. Uh, we are. Uh, thank you to everyone who came to the uh, Christmas show in Nottingham. Yeah, and thanks to everyone fun. who watched uh, along at home. Uh, it was a good show. I enjoyed it. Yeah, it was really fun. Lovely venue. Really great venue. Very nice venue. Do you know what? Let's shout out, because I forgot to mention during the show, to Michael, who is one of the, um, who's a brilliantly um, camp member of Front of House Lovely staff, guy. Who's like, so what's this tonight? And uh, we said, oh, we do a podcast about serial killers. And he was like, mm, who's your favourite? Yeah. And then, <laughs> great and I said, oh, I'm not sure. What about you, Michael? He went, well, Jeffrey Dahmer. Yeah. He went, especially with Evan Peters playing him. <laughs> and he was a great laugh. And do you know what? At the end, he came up, he said, he said, well, I really enjoyed that. He said, was that all ad-libbed? I said, oh, yeah, we have the information for the show, but then we just chat. And he was like, reminded me of sort of Victoria Wood or something like that. I had a lovely time. Oh, isn't that nice? Yeah, he was a lovely guy. Yeah. So thank you very much, Nottingham Arts uh, and Theatre. Thank, thank, Nottingham Arts Theatre. So thanks to Next Up yeah. as well. You're you're doing that on your tour? I am, yeah. It's not quite on sale yet, but I'm going back to Nottingham at the Arts Theatre, so I can't wait. And we met everyone afterwards, which is lovely. And because we've got these cards, um, 
like as part of our merch. Well, this is just obscene, quite frankly. <laughs> this note finds you dry bummed. It's just obscene. <laughs> I just <laughs> like, who are you sending that to? Like what kind I of I send it to people. Well, I mean Fine. <laughs> and I'm part of this. But I don't know what's wrong with you people. <laughs> it, you know, if I how could you send that to somebody? You've got to be really specific with who you send that to? Well, do you know what? I did a thing where um, I sent if people mess if people bought tickets in their first week of my tour going on sale, I'm would giving them as presents and message me. I would send a handwritten card going, you know, Rachel's bought your tickets to da da, and I used some of them were like, you know, they're a legend or whatever, and someone was like, they own a fetish store, and I was like, I've got just the card for this person. Well, I imagine that that person would have gone a bit much that. <laughs> <laughs> You're ruining me. Christmas. Ruin Christmas. Um, uh, crass, <clears throat> if anything. Crass. And we've got loads of, have you noticed now we've got this behind us, we've got loads of little yeah. bits that we've been given at this show. This brilliant. I love this that one. This is so good. I don't know how much of People this still is. mention this one as well. We signed that in Nottingham. Um, <clears throat> this is things. not great for the podcast, but <clears throat> essentially we have lots of merch, but well, not merch, gifts behind us that we've been given by legends over the uh, over. And the this years. is just what's at your gaff. There's yeah. more at mine. There's all kinds of stuff. Yeah. Anyway, what was it? Why were we chatting about it? So, Nottingham was great. Thank you very much for coming and thanks uh, for Next Up for screening it. And thanks to everyone who's booked to see our tour. We're really excited yeah, about it. it not wait. many tickets left, so be quick. No, a couple of us sold out. Your already. tour is on sale as well. Yes. Anyway. Um, did you have a nice Christmas? Yes, I did. I did, actually. Yeah, it was, all, it was all right. It was always people in the house, which is really lovely. That's how I like it. But then when everyone left, there was just two days and my partner and I where we read in silence on separate sofas. And it was That's nice. Great. Had cheese and biscuits and watch ghost yeah. stories. Yeah. See, that's yeah. perfect, that. Yeah, it's really nice. That's what like. I uh, went to Tim's family's. That was nice. And then... Oh, I didn't ask. And then... <laughs> well, the people want to know. And I... Uh, then we went to Harrogate for, for two nights for New Year to the Old Swan, which is um, not a nightclub. <laughs> it's a hotel, the one where Agatha Christie, when she flounced off for 10 days, 11 days... Um, because her husband was cheating on her. Uh, that's where she was found. I'm reading a book about it at the minute. It's very interesting. Anyway, we went to a National Trust property as well. Won't be going again over the uh, Christmas period. Uh, went to Fountains Abbey. Lovely. I love a National Trust. I do as well, you know. But, and I'm going to sound awful here, you know what I can't cope with? Well, it's other people, but ill-behaved children, <laughs> you know, we're at an abbey. Monks were burned to death in there. And there's kids like... <laughs> screeching. No one has any control over their children. I want, you know, I wanted lots of nice things. I wanted to take a nice picture. Could I get a picture without a three-wheeled buggy in? No, I fucking couldn't, right? <laughs> it, or, or a heavily pregnant woman with a Kath Kidson jacket on. <laughs> just, people just ruining the, the environment. It just It's it just noise and stuff like that. And it just really annoyed me. And I, there was... People, t- I mean, oh, yes, dogs are nice. And yes, we did have a dog with us, a well-behaved one. Too many dogs. People bring dogs everywhere. People are tripping over dogs. I just, I do, I'm not at peace with people. My Christmas, I, I forgot to say this earlier, that uh, what happened several times over the Christmas, and it was our fault, is that we have a, you know, like a food waste bin on the, on the floor. The dog is now just getting out of his cage, flipping the lid off it and helping himself to whatever is inside. And then we come down the morning and it's absolute chaos. Uh, there's just like dog sh- shit everywhere with tea bags in it and stuff. Oh so no, please. He, we, at night we bring him out. Of, he's in the kitchen in his little cage in the day and then we bring him into the living room at night and he, he sort of like falls asleep on a blanket in there. So we're doing that. But his farts were so bad because he's just been like hammering Brussels sprout casings and things that we put Vicks under our nose like you do in a... You know, when like you're doing when you a, go to see a dead body? Yeah, when you're doing an autopsy. Oh my God. Because he God. was absolutely fundamentally changing the atmosphere in the room at one point like i always have candles was it going worse than michael here. fish it was it was genuinely it was michael fish bad yeah i thought the paint was going to peel off the walls it was unbelievable so um that was my that when i think of christmas i can still taste it oh don't that's um do the worst thing is i'm hungry my stomach started rumbling when you said that that's horrible <laughs> I'll get you some tea bags and some sprout cases. Oh, don't. Um, we are going to be talking about a case that we've talked about talking about for a while. We normally go for something big in the new year. This will probably be a multi-parter. We just don't know how many parts yet. I hate him and I think he's a tosser. Okay, so we are doing, um, so part one of episode 105 mm-hmm. is uh, it's the Unibomber. 
um, Ted Kaczynski, sometimes pronounced Kaczynski, um, which is the original way to pronounce it, but Kaczynski is how it is pronounced. Well, he's dead, so I don't think he's going to write him. <laughs> Unabomber. Um, Unabomber. <laughs> Unabomber. Unabomber. Um, well, I think Unabomber sounds like something that I would buy from ASOS that would give me a camel toe, like <laughs> immediately. You know, something you can't raise your arms yes. in, otherwise it goes right up the middle. <laughs> You're not sure how to wear it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Unibom. <laughs> God, don't. Um, he is a... I mean, he. I didn't realise until I started to sort of like researching this that he had 18 years of getting away with it before he was found. It was a massively expensive manhunt. It was $50 million, what? the manhunt, to find him. And I think they only sort of found him not... It was basically well, someone coming forward. Yeah, that's and he probably would have, if that hadn't happened, he'd still have got away with that, I would imagine. Yes. Now, he has a... He doesn't have a very high uh, death count not that we're complaining it was three people who died but there was a fair amount it was 23 people who were injured or maimed because basically he spent a long time of that eight, 18 years refining his technique and um, we'll talk about it later but he had a diary where he, he kept sort of being really irritated that he ha- wasn't able to d- uh, create a lethal bomb he's um, I find him Highly irritating myself, but yeah. I also I find him obnoxious, mm-hmm. king of the incels. <laughs> and I, you know, you know, what I hate about him more than anything. Like what what he did. I mean, I just find the idea of doing this to people who are just. I mean, any any sort of crime's horrible, but you know, people just opening post. Yeah, and there's a particular one of a, a the advertising executive who was mm. killed when there was children in the house as well. Yeah. So I just find him... Also, how dare he take the joy of getting a parcel and well, opening exactly. it away from people? Well, having said that, the um, when I used to work at the Tourist Information Centre in Manchester, I joined uh, the team just uh, after September the 11th, 2001. And um, something happened then, I don't know if you know. And because someone started sending anthrax as well. Do you remember? Oh, yeah, yeah. In the post. Well, like, yeah, they put like talc in and so it was Yeah, anthrax. and I worked with this guy who was like, right, well, if you're opening the post you got to put these gloves on and this mask because, uh, you know, the anthrax thing that's going around at minute. I'm thinking, it's not going to be at Manchester Tourist Information Centre, is it? <laughs> so I just to open these letters requesting an accommodation guide <laughs> with, like, a you know, a mask and a bloody pair of plastic gloves on. Also, what is that doing if there's anthrax in it? Nothing. Like it's, you, you clearly be dead anyway. Yeah, exactly. Um, I love it when people get really excited about something like a fishes like that. Oh, yeah. You know, when they, I think the people who, you know, at airports where you're not allowed, like, whatever, a small bottle of shampoo, I think they absolutely love being like, you've got to bin that. Do they look, we've well, we've been through this, this before, before, and it is bullshit. And Manchester Airport is one of the few international airports now that you still have to put your um, bits and bobs in a plastic bag. Oh, yeah, it's sort of been phased out, hasn't yeah. it? But Manchester just still carries on. As if there's not enough disruption at that bloody airport. I, I, did, I had to put it all, when I flew internationally to New Zealand, I had it all in a bag. But I'll tell you what didn't happen on the way to New Zealand. They're all back. Nobody checked my fucking visa. Not once. Really? Not once was my visa looked at. Maybe they had it electronically. Maybe. Yeah, maybe. Maybe they asked you to bring a physical cut anyway. Um, so Ted Kaczynski is uh, it, his parents are Polish immigrants. Yep. His and name's Theodore John Kaczynski. Yes, for yep. for name fans out there, he has a brother called David. Yeah. Um, David is very integral to the case, and he and he and Ted are. Well, it's weird. I, the word grass close. springs to mind. <laughs> They weren't close, but I think David really looked up to him mm-hmm. and you can kind of see why. They were just sort of kind of a, a quite straight yeah. normal family, weren't they? Yeah, he was born on 22nd of May, 1942 in Chicago. Working class family, parents were Polish Catholics, they later became atheists though. The parents, um, Wanda was the mother and uh, the, the dad was Theodore Richard Kaczynski. He was a sausage maker. Uh, make of that what you will. <laughs> so many jokes. Uh, they married on the 11th of April, 1939. The family were described as civic-minded and good parents. Mm-hmm. Um, they made lots of sacrifices to make sure that their sons had a very good life. Mm. They were quite frugal as well. So mm-hmm. they even there wasn't a lot of money coming into the house, but they were really careful with what they had, um, which comes back in later life because Ted frequently borrows money from them and they have the means to do it because mm-hmm. they were so careful when they were growing up. Both sons were very intelligent, 
But Ted was exceptionally clever. Um, he was very, very smart, but he seemed quite lonely to the kids in the neighbourhood. He was quite mm. a bit of a loner, sort of on his own, and uh, didn't really... But the other thing is, he, he attended Sherman Elementary School. He was happy and well-adjusted there. And David was born in 1949, and then they moved to Evergreen Park. Now, Ted goes to Evergreen Park Central Junior High, and his IQ was tested at 167, so he skipped the sixth grade. He'd loved being amongst his peers because, I think, because he was a lot smarter than mm. them and he was very much a leader uh, amongst a lot of his friends. So when they take him out of that environment and they put him with older kids, he couldn't fit in and he ended up being bullied by them. Yeah, well, I think there's two. I, I, I've been in schools where kids have been moved up three years. I briefly was moved up for, for a year. I don't think that was a clerical error looking back, but like... I think I don't know that it's a great idea because I understand you've got to push them intellectually, but it is still mm. like an eight-year-old with eleven-year-olds, and yeah, it, I, I think, do think it causes problems. I think leave them where if they're smart in their year, challenge them with something different. Yeah, just leave them where they are with you know because they might be smart, but they do want to be around kids their own age. But he remained smart. Like he went to uh, there's a, there's a important bit in his childhood we should talk about now. His his mum says that basically one day David turns around and says to his mum, "Mummy, what's wrong with Teddy?" Um, because he could just sense that his brother was different. And at first, I think he thought it was to do with the fact that he's really clever. He says um, he was amazing at music, he would do like these incredible compositions, and and also really academic. So he said, "Oh." when we were growing up, everyone would say, oh, your brother's going to be the next Einstein. And we thought, well, he's either going to be Bach or Einstein. So he was like good in different areas. Although I would say music's quite mathsy, but that's from Mm -hmm. someone who can't read music and doesn't actually know anything about music. I I just got a feeling it's creative maths. I would agree with that to a certain extent. Can you read music? Can I fuck? (laughs) Just two people who know nothing being like, we've decided. I am terrible at maths and I have no musical ability. Well, Owen, you're a musician. Is it mathsy? Ah, interesting, oh, right, okay. Oh, interesting. I don't know if they, they avoid taxes on purpose. But... Yeah, no, I think it's that one. Uh, Gary Barlow. Um, <laughs> so he says, what is wrong with Teddy? And he's and his mum said, well, when he was little, he was about nine months old, I think, he had got a rash all over his body. They took the baby into the hospital. He was in there for but somewhere between a week and ten days. There's different reports on it. And... There was a received wisdom at the time that n- normally you would stay if your if your kid is in hospital you would just stay with them and they were like no 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 that doesn't help the healing and they were allowed to visit him twice a week so this baby was removed very suddenly and put in this environment and so he comes back and apparently he was just completely different she writes in her diary this is in. 1942, I think, uh, 42 or 45. Uh, she says, baby home from hospital and healthy, but quite unresponsive. It was 1945 when she wrote this. And apparently that was it. It was like a switch had flicked and he was completely different. But there, there's a lot of instances along the way where something unusual happens to Ted and it influences his behaviour. So the fact that he's he's removed from his family when he's a kid, the fact that he's a genius, the fact that he's moved up, the fact that he's goes to Harvard at 16 years of age. Mm, which we'll get to in a minute. Yes, and, and I, has a tough time there. I don't know what I think about this. That was something to do with it being in hospital for being as a kid. I don't know. He was horrible. He was also horrible to his family. He knew he was smarter than them. Yeah. He would argue with the dad all the time. There's a, there's a horrible story about his mum coming in holding a casserole and he comes up to her and he's like smiling, um, which when I think his brother is recounting the story is like, which is unusual anyway for him to <laughs> smile at any of us. He holds out the seat for his mum and as she sits down, he pulls it back and she pours this boiling casserole all over herself and... And then there's this big argument. What a shit. He's a shit. Yeah, he's a shit. What a waste of casserole. It is a waste of casserole, but also that's dangerous. It's really dangerous. And she's like crying and dad's screaming and he just goes up to his room and is laughing. So there's something wrong with him. At one point, his mum doesn't know what's going on and goes and speaks to someone um, at a local school for for people with autism. And is like, can we send him here? They just were a bit kind of despairing. They didn't know what was going on with their son, basically. Um so, I think he might just be an asshole. Yes. Well, yeah. Also, like, you know, I think sometimes if people are really bright, there's obviously like a frustration there. But sometimes I know people who aren't like don't have an IQ of 167, but they're, and it's men, they are the smartest 
bear in their social group and they are all <clears throat> without exception dangerous because mm-hmm. they think they have this they have this elevated sense of self because they're like I'm the clever one and often they are but only because their friends yeah, are fucking yeah, potatoes exactly, yeah. and I honestly think it makes people like when they... you, said, you said potato it made my stomach rumble go on <laughs> <laughs> do you want to go and get you some potato peelings from the <laughs> <laughs> no but I agree with you I think that is it's dangerous to be the smartest one it's the da- it's the train men dynamic you know you see men on a train and they're all drinking, and there's always one that's like that thinks they're. Oh yeah, it's the yeah yeah it's the boss, that's... and they're always bullying the nice one. Yeah, yeah. Um, so he was he was shy when he was growing up, but he was kind of he was fine. But when he moved up to Harvard, especially, he found it very difficult. Well, well, when he m- was moved up a year at school, uh, he did continue to be ahead of his classmates who were mm. older. Uh, especially in, he was in an advanced maths class. He, he, ma- he mastered the subject so well. That was a terrible sentence. He mastered the subject um, and he skipped the 11th grade and he graduated at 15 after attending a summer school and he won a, a scholarship to Harvard. Mm. But he wasn't very prepared for this because no. he is still a 15-year-old boy. Yeah. Um, he was a maths proje- prodigy and they moved him into this intimate space to live with other precocious new students. Oh, God, imagine My- <laughs> he was described as very intelligent but socially reserved. Um, I think that's fine, nothing wrong with that. He graduated in 1962. Mm-hmm. But while he was there at Harvard, he participated unwillingly, he said later on. Mm. Uh, he was sort of coerced into it, he said. And it was a controversial study by a psychologist called Helen Murray. Now, this study was backed by the CIA and it was uh, the project code name for this study was Project MK Ultra. And it was inspired by mind control techniques used on US prisoners of war in Korea by the Soviet Union, China, and North Korea. Mad. Now, the program um, sought to understand how minds, how you control, control minds, and sometimes used LSD. But there is no evidence that this was used in the one that Ted yeah. took part in. So, th- what this study was tr- attempting to do was attempting to produce a per- perfect truth drug. For interrogation of suspects um, of, who were Cold War, so who they thought were Cold War Soviet spies, um, and other ways of mind control. Do you know what I love about this? Is like <clears throat> I studied, I did a psychology uh, A level, and I started a degree in it. Right, and I love that. <laughs> in the sixties, things were just fucking wild. Like you didn't need to get permission for anything, so they were like. Pretend it's a prison for a bit. Yeah, it's you know, like the fifties and sixties, <laughs> yeah. they did some absolutely nuts that experiment, stuff. Experiment, prison experiment. Yeah, they're like keep a baby from its from its family and just see what just happens. See what happens, yeah. Yeah, Ch- change the gender of that child, but don't ever tell it. Like, yeah, don't tell anyone because it's a botched circumcision. Let's split these triplets up. <laughs> yeah, just and see, what, see what happens. It is absolutely mad that how because it's so interesting, isn't it? That like I remember when I was doing anything like psychology related, you have to do a study, you'd have to get all this informed consent, da da da, and sometimes informed consent it affects the outcome because you're going, this is what we're looking at and then people want to respond mm-hmm. correctly. So it does alter it and you're like, oh, I wish you could do it without informed consent and be like, well, we were allowed to for a while and some people wanked off dolphins, split up babies, you know, like it's just tortured students. Thank in God Harvard. it wasn't the other way around. <laughs> <laughs> Have you read about that story about a, a woman that they're like training dolphins and she was like, oh, he just wouldn't let me get on with it until I gave him a hand job. What, the dolphin? Yes. Yeah. Oh, I, I mean, hate dolphins. I think they're horrible creatures. You Fi- wouldn't give it a hand job? No. File under chimps. Not for me. File under chimps. I hate them. You see, it's mad that the two... <laughs> 90s animals. Yeah, yeah, but the two creatures that everyone's like, oh, I love dolphins, me. Or, oh, uh, chimps. They're, they are dangerous, horrible creatures. Dolphins are rapists. Yeah, gang rape, yeah. And chimpanzees are fucking vicious. Yeah. They're horrible creatures. And I would... I'd see. I'd be happy for both of them to be extinct. I don't give a shit. I don't <laughs> get rid. Gone. Um, <clears throat> strong views. I wasn't expecting just that. Just horrible creatures. You don't want to swim with no I fucking chimps. <laughs> don't want to swim with chimps. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't want to have a laugh with a dolphin. <laughs> um, so the, this experiment, they put like bright lights on people mm. and, and interrogate them they'd make them write essays about their values and, and things that were important to them and then they would interrogate them about that and rip it to shreds they just can't take criticism basically can they is, is what i think happened to Ted. Well, it's interesting that they've taken a group of very gifted people who've probably done brilliantly and always been able to express themselves yeah. academically through essays and then Im- try to humiliate them and that 
this is often cited as one of the things that affected Ted. Well, because that, that's what they did. They used the essays as the base for the insults. Yeah. Um, sound like comedy reviews, don't they? <laughs> so Ted apparently took part for 200 hours over three years and he said that his mental health and emotional well-being suffered. In my opinion, I just think this is an excuse. They couldn't blame his mum, so they found Helen Murray, another woman, to blame for Ted's problems. Interesting. Um, he then enrolled at the University of Michigan. He earned his master's and doctoral degrees in mathematics in 1964 and 1967. Michigan wasn't his first choice, though. Oh, can I just to go back to his time at Harvard? <clears throat> he, uh, when he graduated, he his final grade was ninety eight point nine percent. He finished the highest in his year at Harvard, and he was he was very young. Was he sixteen when he finished? I think, there? Uh, probably about eighteen, maybe. Yeah, I'm eighteen. So he's graduating as the Ooh, highest. The best at adding up. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, know your times tables. But the, he becomes, yeah, he graduates in 62. He becomes very withdrawn. And in the final couple of years, he, he'd he always spoken, so he didn't really have, like, great friends, but he had some some people mm. that he connected with. And he would talk about ideas a lot. And he, what he talked about is how he was worried about where technology was going. Um, He was very anti-technology. And I'm a bit like that. Oh, really? Uh, I don't even like filming this. Well, do you know what? There's, there's weird bits of this where I'm like, well, he's right about that bit. Yeah, there are a little, but not people aren't wrong all the time. I know, but it's David Icke, isn't it? <laughs> because I, for some, I'm like, well, he's he's, he's on the money there. Like, but... I'm very against AI. What is it mostly used for, as far as I can see, to create pornography and, and images of women without their consent? I would say that is what most people are fucking about with it for, and I just think it's fucking wrong. Every technology that happens, though, is just another way of making porn weirder i know but i just think it's fine it's like we've got so far i just think there are limits and i think there has to come a point where we go well no that's not all right um he also said that harvard going back to what we are talking about which is the unabomber he said that harvard was an elitist and snobby place and when he came back and david was like how's university he said he said he was ted was being very weird and distant with him and was like david was like you're really clever like i'm so in awe of you and he said uh Real, all real smart people have a sadistic streak in them. Was something that he had learnt at Harvard, or was or sort of operating by. So, I think that t- I think there's a series of things that sort of damage him, and then you've got the uh, sort of like crucial uh, kingpin in it of him being an arsehole because he's the smartest one. Well, I think when he thinks people have a sadistic streak, it's just him not getting invited to parties. <laughs> Stop being weird, and people might invite you, Ted. <laughs> Fucking weirdo. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, goes to Michigan Uni, uh, gets a PhD in theoretical mathematics. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a camping trip about this time as well. So um, he gets really into being out and about in in nature, in the wilderness. And he and David go camping. And when they get there, Ted says, "Why don't we have a few days where we don't eat any food that's made by a corporation or or anything like that? We just live off the land, off berries and things like that." And David's like, "Yeah, great, let's try it." And then about six hours later, David's like, I'm hungry. <laughs> and he goes to the car and eats a load of biscuits, which is exactly how I would do, like, eating at, do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, I just want to be one at nature. Just and living just, off the land. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> slamming stray peanuts at front, in the footwell of my car after, like, a few hours. Going across a field to, like, a moto services <laughs> to get some chicken nuggets. <laughs> so he is, Ted, he says, oh, Ted, like, I ate these cookies and Ted loses it and he just drives off in the car and he leaves David there and he was like we made an agreement that we wouldn't re- eat anything corporate that we wouldn't oh, be consumers but drives off in his car yeah well this is this is what pisses me off about him so he drives off and he leaves his brother there and he comes back the next day and he's like oh sorry I'm the annoyed. next day yeah so he, he's overnight Imagine being like... God, imagine it, Paul... It, I know what I'd be like, though. I'd be like, I regret nothing. God, if David was hungry, he must have been hungry overnight. Oh, my God. He's took the biscuits with him. <laughs> He's got no... Listen, I'm hungry now. <laughs> that must have been awful for him. I think it was. I actually think that David had a really rough time of Ted. It seems like the family is quite... <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> excuse me. You've been eating berries from the wilderness again. I'm sorry, I've got a berry in my throat, actually, from for <laughs> I tell you what, it's a year of foraging this year. Oh, people are into that now, aren't they? Yeah, well, I've always, like, liked eating things for free. What is this? <clears throat> I'm going to have to use AI to finish the podcast for you guys. <laughs> <laughs> mm. How's that? Is that better? 
That's loads it. better. Do you know, I hate it when like your own spit gets in your face. It's like, oh, my body's attacking me. I'm being silenced by uh, myself. Have you ever Am choked I? on your own spit on stage? No. <laughs> so, you know, sometimes, have you ever had that where your, your own spit goes down like the wrong way? Yeah, but not on stage. Yeah, well, I've had it on stage where I'm like, sorry, just my own, own spit trying to ruin the gig here. I've never felt more disgusting. I might as well have a flap out. Like, it's, <laughs> I feel so vile. Anything like that that shows how, like, you're just a meat sack, I absolutely hate. Yeah. Well, have you ever done it where you're talking and you get, like, do you know what, a neck burp? Yes. One that, of those. And you're like, did that, that pick up that, on the microphone? Grrr, I've had yeah. that. Like, grrr, yeah, yeah, I've had that. Awful. Does my stomach rumbling pick up on the recording? No. I can't even hear it. I think it. Owen's lying there. I didn't like the way she I can't hear head. it. That's okay. Cool. Do you know what? I went, you're getting beach body ready, mate. No, I've just... Summer bodies are made in the winter. I'll tell you what, I went to my table table last night. Oh, God. I fucking So, can love... I just say, Rachel is always welcome to stay yeah, at I my know, house. I know, but... Right, well, no, I just thought last night, because I've been around people. I've not been home since the, what was it, the 20th yeah, of fair. December. I thought it'd be nice to just be a bit of peace, get me, get me, do me research for, you know, crack on with this. But there is a, you know, I love Premier Inn, but next door there is the chain restaurant, the table table. I love it. I am unashamedly. <laughs> I fucking love it. What uh, did you have? I had uh, a vegetable Thai curry. Lovely. But I did have a chicken breast put in it. <laughs> um, I was actually going to go for the vegan chicken breast, but I thought I'd just have the chicken breast. But I, I did eat uh, the other day at a vegetarian, not purposefully, uh, and I felt so much better for it. Really? Felt light. You're going to do veganuary? Well, no, it's a bit like our chicken breast last night. Oh, yeah. But I, I purposefully, I, I am making a, a thing this year to uh, eat less meat because, I mean, I only really eat chicken and beef anyway, but I just like animals and I can't keep liking animals if I keep eating them. Mm. And it, I feel bad. Really? Yeah, I do. I can't keep going, oh, look at these lovely animals and, oh, watching all these nice videos of animals. You know, oh, look at this cow. And, and, Not and many then, nice videos of chickens out there. There are. Are the ones with the disco ball. Is that what they... People keep sending me chicken content and I'm... Because <clears throat> you've got chickens now. I'm you? not interested. Kimmy likes chickens. Well, there's one where there's a disco Send ball. Send a load of chicken stuff. Which someone puts a Care disco... of PBJ no, management. Don't, don't do that. <laughs> then they put a disco ball in with their chickens and the chickens are kind of looking at it and there's a goose that's like that. And so she puts it in and she comes back the next day and I swear to God, the goose is in the same position staring at and I just think that it looks like the most the goose is just like ah for like a whole <laughs> evening it looks so if you're a goose you'd be like what the fuck yeah, is, what is that it? what is that it's like a spaceship yeah so I think don't put mirror balls in with you bit of wholesome Chickens. content for you I did put on Instagram the other day uh obviously I was in um Yorkshire over the old Christmas period and on New Year's Day we're driving the road it's very rainy and windy horrible weather and we had to stop because some ducks wanted to cross the road that's lovely that's lovely it's my favourite road sign actually is a little duck crossing they just went they they went across I was like ducks are rapists yeah, I know. Well, did I tell you about Tim's mum? We went to the... What? No, <laughs> Where's no, this no, gonna sorry, go? sorry, no. So we, went, <laughs> we visited this... Yeah, I mean, like last year, whatever mating season is for ducks, is it spring? I don't know. We went to this pond and uh, we were just looking at the nice pond and, of course, there was some male ducks trying mm-hmm. to attack and Tim's mum just ran over and battered him. She was like, get off her! Yeah. Leave her. And Tim's like, it's nature. She's like, well, I won't stand by and watch no, this. No, <clears throat> I would be... Um... I'd be like throwing the polar bear a steak, mate. I'm, I can't leave things. It, I mean, the other day, we've got cockerels, got five of the twats, and now the four of them are coming to maturity. So the eldest one, for a start, is blinded to, well, blinded one of my chickens and had a go at my other favourite one. So she's got bad vision in one eye. So I hate him. And then the others are coming to sexual maturity, which means they're just, they're just sexually assaulting hens minding their own fucking business and I if I see them doing it I will pick up the ch- cockle yeah. and I'll throw it um, but well, now I've gathered all the cockles up and I've put them on their own field far away because cockles if they're are not around women don't fight they exist quite peacefully okay so it's women that are the problem are we, yeah it's us again is it yeah do they form like a little gang like the yeah. t-birds yeah they're a little gang you'll see them getting little them. leather jackets <laughs> I'd love that yeah they've around, got like right? a, they've still got a pecking order and a hierarchy but now they're just it's kind of peaceful. Interesting. And the women are like, oh, thank God. The women are just My, their own little commune. Having a lovely themselves. time. There's no fighting. Everyone's co-hackers had a fucking break after being pounded. You know what that is, right? 
Did it's, I? It's just like a meat bag full Did of I genitals. Hear something there? What? I swear to God, I heard someone shout my name. Then is there a Rachel in the room? Am I going mental? I did not hear someone shout your name. We're going to have to play Great. it back. I'm haunted now. EVP. I went on a ghost tour, actually, in Lincoln. Something's latched onto me. That's where we are. <laughs> I can't believe I've got a demon for the new year. <laughs> Unbelievable. Uh, also, ghost tour delivered by a woman. Rarity. Very rare, isn't it? Mm. All that sort of, like, ripperology. And it's interesting, isn't it? Because true crime is definitely, like... For the women. Mm-hmm. And ghosts and stuff like that. It's all men sort of, mm. you know... Taking the... Taking yeah. the lead on that one. And actually, we went on the ghost tour and Tim said, because we've been on... Every ghost tour we've been on, which he hates, my I stress, uh, <laughs> are delivered by men. But Tim actually said she had a very nice manner about her and it was nice to have a woman deliver the tour. Oh, to just him. say you like her tits, Tim. It's obvious. <laughs> she, she's a very nice lady. She had like... um a cowl on and I like that love that and she she said I've been doing this tour for 23 years I thought oh, wow I want to be you when I grow up oh you'd be great at that I'd love to do that actually I wouldn't I hate talking to people I think you zone out right like you're doing your set <laughs> well I don't think she did she was very Anna did a video and um which I, I think which looked like it had an orb on it it didn't and I said to him look at this it's got an orb on it he went let me show the lady oh, so I think he nerd. did like it what didn't <laughs> So he uh, he has a difficult relationship with women in university. There's a few that he sort of takes a shine to and it's never reciprocated and he gets quite um, quite pushy. He sort of creeps a lot of women out, basically. There's one in particular that he feels that he's spurned by and very shortly afterwards when the bomb started. So again, it's another woman that they try and um, blame for. So he's got Hang this- on, how shortly after? Because... <laughs> the first bombing is in 1978. Um, so how, how... Yeah, I'm not sure it's that. So in 1971, that's when he was living in a remote cabin. And in 1969 is when he left university. Right. So why are you blaming... Why is... Yeah, it's any excuse, isn't it? So we should say Michigan wasn't his first choice, by the way. The only one off to offer him a grant and a teaching post. Mm-hmm. Now, he specialised in... Doesn't it show you there that he was very, very smart and very sought after, but... He's still a working class lad, needed that money to be yeah. able to go and do the study. So, enrolled at, at that university in Michigan, he specialised in complex analysis, specifically geometric theory. Mm. No idea. Um, a professor there, Peter Duran, said Ted was unusual unusual and not like the other graduate students. He said he had a drive to discover the mathematical truth. Um, professor Alan Shields said it wasn't enough to say that Ted was smart. In a grade evaluation, he was the best man he had ever seen. <sighs> that denotes that there's a woman who was better. <laughs> so he hated it. Now, something sh- happens. So in 1966, he says for a few weeks that he experienced sexual fantasies of being female and considered gender transition. Now, he changed his mind in the waiting room to see a psychologist. He said he went in. And he just chatted about other things because he's changed his mind. And he never disclosed to the psychologist the reasons for, that he'd made the appointment. And he said afterwards he, he was enraged, right? And he said he thought about killing the psychiatrist and several other people that he hated. Reasonable. He then said he felt disgusted about his what he said was his uncontrolled sexual cravings. Um, but then he said this was a major turning point for him and he felt like a phoenix from the ashes to new hope. Oh, went a bit live, laugh, love at the end there, didn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so, hold on. So, he thought that he wanted to transition gender to being a woman. Yeah, because uh, he was having intense sexual um, fantasies about being, being a, a woman. woman. Okay. And then when he gets there, he's like, oh, no, I just... Yeah, he's in the waiting room and he goes, oh, actually, I think I've changed my mind. And he talks about other stuff to the psychiatrist, who has no idea why he's there, by the way. Interesting. And then he's pissed off because he's like, I guess he thinks, why don't you pick up on it? Mm. There's a lot going on. There's a lot going there? on. So he has this job and... Oh, it's gone. Oh, sorry. Don't know why I'm doing this. Uh, he goes to Berkeley as an acting assistant professor. He mm-hmm. taught maths. Uh, he was one of the youngest assistant professors in the university history and he was on ta- on track for a tenure. Is that how you say it? Yeah, tenure. He he wasn't well liked, though. No. And he, he was a shit teacher. He just read from books and refused to answer questions. That's mad. <laughs> well, he didn't want the job. Basically, he didn't want the job. He didn't want to work. What he wanted, he'd got it fixed in his mind by then. 
I just want a bit of land. I want to remove myself from technology and just go and live wild. And so as soon as he'd saved up enough money, mm -hmm. he handed his notice in yeah. and they were like, but you're going to, you're going to, basically like, you're going to be a really important part of this university. We've got all this stuff planned for you. Like, and he, nah. he, he could, they couldn't understand why he didn't want to stay and he couldn't understand why they, what like why they wouldn't see that he would want to go off so he goes and gets this um cabin in lincoln montana um he apparently in that area it's not actually that unusual for people to be quite hermity there off because grid off grid exactly uh off grid gives me such do you know what he reminds me of we we're talking about this earlier i absolutely hate this is one man, one intolerance. You know me, I'm like aggressively liberal. Here we go. Hippies can fucking die. <laughs> I cannot stand hippies. Especially the, well, because I can't think of any other kind. The hippies who are like, yeah, just be off grid. I don't want to be part of the system. Like, yeah, but you still use doctors. So like, you still use, you still use loads of the parts mm. of the system. You still drive on the road. You still got a car. It, it, yeah, ex except everyone else has still to pay for Tesco. it. <laughs> and you still have fucking rich parents. Oh, the only people who act like that are people who have something financially to fall yes. back on, which Ted is. He was always taking money from his parents. Do you know about three times a year, I say I'm going off grid as a threat. <laughs> oh, I've had, I'm sick of this, mate. I'm going off grid. <laughs> I am. I'm going off grid, mate. I do think about that, you know, sometimes. Well, I live in the middle of nowhere and I'm planning to, like, for, for eco reasons, like, oh, okay, well, there's springs here. I think we could do the water and there's enough room for solar panels and things like that. And it's not because I, like, I don't want the government to know what's going on. It's just that there's an environmental Can impact. I have a small hut at the end of a field? Absolutely. And yeah. I just bring, they'll bring that bin that the dog has been eating out of <laughs> and I'll make me own sandwiches from it <laughs> and I'll reuse the tea bags. <laughs> and I'll be fine. Well, do you know what? One of the reasons why we've got, like, so this bookcase goes, like, two stories up. Uh, it's not full. Um, is because I have got this paranoia. I have got some, like, Unabomber tendencies, I think. Well, at some point, like, I, I remember reading this thing that, like, if, the, if, if like, an AI becomes sentient, it will go onto the internet where all the information is and you won't be able to access the internet because it'll just like have everything and it'll be really scary. And so I was like, I've, books are really important to me because like if it all goes tits up, okay, well, I do have like yeah. a book on family medicine, you know, like, do you know what I mean? <laughs> From okay. 1912. Yeah, it is. It is. It'd be like... <laughs> Um, loads of just put dentists. cocaine on the baby's gums and it'll be fine <laughs> <laughs> but I, the thing of like having a physical copy of knowledge is important yeah I know that sounds really oh no no top. no I'm with you on this I will learn I will take in more information if I if I read it on a page in a book on a Kindle I don't you know scrolling through scrolling through you, you're taking bits in you're, it's, yeah I think very important look you've got a copy of Wilkie Collins the Moonstone there <laughs> Everything's going to be fine, mate. <laughs> After the funeral by Agatha Christie, everything's going to be all right. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I do have some of these sort of like off-gridy sort of tendencies, but also the people I know who are like, do you know what the first step to it is? No offence, and d to quote Rachel, don't at me, a houseboat. Those uh, My stomach's going now. Can you hear that? Oh, my God, we're synchronising. I can't believe we've synced starvation. I, but, but you know what I think it is? It, the, the sort of us thinking things like that. I just think that's natural... Um, Paranoia? No, your your human, like your natural human what instinct? instincts coming through. I think it it is you know thinking about nature and things like that. That side of us is there. Yeah, and Fuck it yeah. is though. Look, I don't want to. I genuinely. It's, it's all like you know when I was younger and you're more about. I want this. I need that. And then, and, and then as you you get an older, you like you get more in touch with. Basically, because you're going back into the ground is is my opinion. Oh God, Rachel! But, no, I do think this is this is. I think it is. It's, you start to realise you're part of a, a system. You know, you're at one with the trees. You're part of the grass. The animals are your friends. <laughs> in a way, you're Snow White. <laughs> you're Pocahontas. <laughs> but no, I, I do. I think it is. You know, you start noticing the moon more and all that. Malarkey. Yeah, definitely. When I was growing up in this area, I didn't realise like the mountains were there. I just didn't see them and, and things yeah. like that. I d d yeah. <clears throat> do you know what it is as well? It's living in the countryside. Like I was walking the dog this morning and the daffodils are coming up and yeah. it is the third, Already? third of J January. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, the seasons are fucked. Well, they know many eggs are in the shops. That's what's happening. <laughs> Oh my God, there's a Tory, <laughs> Tory MP at the moment who's like, if you think that we should ban mini eggs coming in in January, please write to me because I, like, you've got an election coming up, lads. You're going to have to really 
Put some other things in the crosshairs of the mini eggs. I, I love mini eggs being out on the 1st of January because I love mini eggs. <laughs> and that's what I said. I went, oh, 1st of January, I'm going to get myself a bag of mini eggs. <laughs> Not done it yet. One of the things I miss, actually, mini eggs of being vegan. Oh, mini the, the You make it make... No, don't, because don't, my I'm stomach re- is rumbling. But no, I think this is true. I think, you know, as you get older, you you, you start to realise that the important things in life are not not the items you get, but the world around you. I think I think I still love the items I get. I'm just buying them in wood now and not plastic. I think that's the only <laughs> thing that's changed. That's my idea of being like ethical. Is like I just spend more, and it's made from hemp. As I sit here with this landfill. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so he buys this um, cabin. I mean, his acreage. He's got 1.4 acres, which is a, a football pitch and a half. Basically, that's Ooh, an acre. It's all right, isn't it? Well, I don't think that is very much to. To, maybe because I live on a farm, it doesn't feel big. But like that's a big garden for one person. Yeah, he can yeah. grow his veg there. Well, he, he can, it, but he doesn't grow anything because it's incredibly harsh winters. He lives in a cabin that is made from plywood, so it must be freezing, and it's ten foot by fourteen foot, so it's absolutely tiny. Okay. In fact, the cell he ends up in is bigger than oh, really? the, the cabin that he was <laughs> living in. Um, the only heat is a, a pot-bellied stove in there. Um, I, there's not. It's oh not my god! Probably... Is that stove shaming? <laughs> <laughs> Awful. But you can't even be like a stove without people commenting on your figure. He has lots of books there about wilderness survival and chemistry are the other things when they uh, when they find the cabin and go through it. And um, they fully remove the cabin. At, well, first they take like seven hundred items out of it, and then they remove the actual cabin and put it. And I think it's in a Ripley's Believe It or Not somewhere. Why? We'll check that and we'll confirm that later on. Um, so he, he bought this land on basically a mountainside. Now, there's a really interesting interview with one of his neighbours who said, I knew him as well after 25 years as I did after the first five minutes of meeting him. So he kept himself to himself. He kind Good. of... Good. More people should be like that. <laughs> no, I like I like everyone knowing everyone's business, you know. No. I mean, fair play to my dad. Know nothing about him. <laughs> Genuinely, I part think of your the dad family. might be a spy. I, do you know what we've said that? Do you reckon dad's a spy? Be, I would not be surprised <laughs> if he was. I wouldn't be surprised. We've said this actually. He might like the perfect sp- like cover for it is that you you just drive coaches, drive coaches. Yeah, don't you know? Just, oh, I'm, I'm off around the country. His you know. family know nothing about him. You know, you're very bright. Like you, you know, I'm not saying your mum isn't, but like you know, you clearly oh, got brains. Dead smart, yeah, brains from both sides. So I think he's a spy, mate. My dad is definitely not the brains in the family. Uh, he's very much um, lifts and um, shouting. <laughs> lifts and shouting. <laughs> lifts and shouting. That's what my dad does. Um, he used to... So he didn't really get on with his neighbours. There was one in particular that he hated called Butch Gehring. Gettering, I think it might be pronounced. Who had a sawmill. So he basically would. He was a logger. And he hated it because he was like, it's a pollution, it's a noise pollution, it's polluting the air. So he was kind of very eco-minded in a time when people weren't, if you think in the 60s, yes, there were sort of hippies, but 60s, 70s, 80s, people weren't really thinking about the environment in the way that we are now. So he he hated this sawmill being close by, but he also used to sneak into this guy's yard and steal loads of bits from the cars at night. Um, and use them in his in his bombs that he was making and experimenting with. So this is another it's thing. Recycling, like, I suppose. Well, it is. He also had handmade guns, so it's like it'll be like a normal barrel and like a, you know, like a whatever that bit's called. Oh no, that's the barrel. That's the barrel. That? barrel, and then one of those things to put the bullets in. Whatever ba- that's barrel. Is it all called a barrel? It's just a barrel, yeah. Right. So one of those things you put the bullets in, and then a barrel, and then it would be on like plywood. And then a trigger. Okay. So it, they're very weird. These are all seized from his properties. So he had all these homemade wooden guns. You just reminded me, actually. Do you know what my favourite... Genuinely, do you know what my favourite Christmas present was? Go on. A reusable deodorant. Reusable? One, one that you get the case and then you just buy oh, yeah, the refills. yeah, they're great. Genuine favourite Christmas present. Are you allowed to say what brand you got? I'm interested. Uh, it's Fussy. Oh, yeah. Is it good? Does it work? Love it. So, Tim's listen. mum got everyone one. Oh, that's and good. And I, I... Do you hear that? I, wow. A war's coming. <laughs> uh, love it. 
genuinely, I thought that is so useful and that's that's changed for me now. I'll just use that. Right. Natural deodorants. Let's get into it. I am a big, I always want to use things that are like natural products. I have tried so many natural deodorants and you might, and some of them are like, there's this rock that you rub under your yeah. arm in a full moon. Or there's one that I got from uh, Lush. One was all right, but it would dry out very quickly. Another one gave me a massive rash under my arms and I don't really get rashes and stuff. There's two that I found that work. One is made by... Um, a brilliant comedian actually called Beth Granville. Her mum makes oh, it. Really? She's a nurse. Yeah, she just bangs it out. It's really good. And um, but it's like she lives in Cardiff, so sometimes it's hard to get it. And there's another one called Bear that is really nice. Where people are like, what perfume's that? And I'm like, it's my deodorant. Yeah. Um, but so many. I just think it, you can't run the risk with deodorants. No, I and agree. And it's a commitment, isn't it? But I did say as well. I said that the test of this, and I because I men do sweat. I think more than women. Yeah. They stink, men, let's be honest. No offence, I mean, you smell delightful. It's a different smell. It's, yeah, it's a different smell. And I, so I said to Tim, I said, he was like, I don't want to use this. I was like, just use it. I said, and see, if it works for you then and it's working for me, try it. Yeah. Very good. Doesn't well, smell. Do you know what it is, is? I think that natural deodorants, they don't stop you sweating, but they like neutralise the stuff, right? So you still will get like wet, if you know what I mean. Yes. But you won't... Um... Well, I'm not a massive sweater on the underarm. Show off. Um, i tell you why. I used a product called Dricklaw oh, years God. ago. Oh, God. Because I used to sweat a lot. It's like medical. And you, you put it under your arms and it, it blocks your, your glands so you, you think so you can't sweat. But since then, I've, I don't know if it was psycho, it must have been psychological, the sweating. So when I wasn't sweating, I wasn't thinking about it. And now I don't sweat as much as I used to. Wow. If that makes sense. Because yeah. it was clearly like a psychological. It's a, like an anxiety, anxiety response. Anxiety response. Yeah. And just used to use Dove deodorant. That was the only one I used. But I'm telling you, a favorite Christmas present. It's just changed. I just, I just think it's a nice product. It smells nice. And it's this good episode is brought to you by Fasting Natural genuinely, Deodorant. I would never have thought of buying one. And I think that was a really nice gift from Tim's mum. It's mom. a lovely gift, though. Keep giving. Right, you lot fucking stink. Have one of these each. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it's a great gift. Good gift, I got. It? I got Kath from Tarot. I got her the, the deodorant that I use. The Bear. It's called Bear. It's a Welsh brand. Yeah. It, yeah, it's brilliant. Lovely. Well, obviously, this is not genuinely not sponsored by anything. If Fussy do want to sponsor us, bring it on. I will talk about it all day. Obviously, don't send us any more. Send us the refills because we've already got the <laughs> thing. I haven't got anything. <laughs> yeah, send her one. And the, I just think it's a fantastic product. And yeah, it's as I say, I'm not getting any money for this. I just think it was a lovely, thoughtful Christmas present. And I thought that that's really good. That that will change. I've got loads of books over Christmas that are like about green living and make like making your own cleaning products and making your own laundry detergent things like that that I'm very into. And one of them is make your own deodorant. And I'm like, I feel like that's a hard line for me. What do you make from bicarbonate of soda and some other stuff? Yes, and like yeah. arrowroot and things like that. And yeah, yeah. Uh, and coconut oil. So you like because I tell you what, the one that I use from the girl in Cardiff, her, her mum who makes it, Maria. Um, it's coconut oil or something else. Like my pits have never looked so good. Like they're really soft, and sometimes I get ingrowing hairs that stopped. Oh well, there you go. There you go. Anyway, what were we talking about? Natural deodorant. Okay, which so, I don't think he used any. No, Ted, did uh, he? Uh, no, I can smell him from the pictures. Yeah. So he used to help himself to the wrecks of. But cars. there is a reason that he used to do that, which we'll get to in a bit. What? Why he used to look? He oh, so they couldn't tell when he'd been away or not. So w w he would walk right, make sure that before he planted a bomb, he would make sure or sent a bomb or you know whatever he's doing, he would make sure that he was seen around the town, mm. and he he would always have a long beard. He would be covered in dirt. He would be smelly and dirty. So everyone would be like, oh, God, there's Teddy fucking stinks. And then the day he was going to leave a bomb or post a bomb, he'd shave, mm. clean himself up put his sunglasses on, nice little hoodie, and um, off he'd go. So people, and then he'd go back into his uh, hut and then grow the beard Yes, back and... so they never really knew when he was there. When he was... So he was basically creating his own alibis and creating, so if he was ever spotted and someone said, the guy is this description, they'd be like, well, Ted doesn't look anything like that. So it's it's pretty smart. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, he'd go around into people's yards at night because there's lots of wrecked cars and he would steal bits from them. Butch's daughter um, 
says that no, she keeps coming to her parents' room and going, I can hear something or someone rooting around outside. There's someone outside my room. And they were like, there's no one outside your room. Go back to bed. And all the time it was it was Ted. He was stealing bits stealing from the car bits. to make his bombs. And do you know what? There's a really chilling story about Butch's wife, Wendy, is out and about with the little girl. I can't, I'm so sorry. I can't remember. I don't think I've written her name down. So Butch out, Junior. No, Butch Junior. <laughs> She's out and about with a little girl. And um, there's some small trees. They're about like three foot high. And so the little girl's playing in the trees while the mum is reseeding some land. And all of a sudden, everything goes really quiet. And she's like, the atmosphere just changed. And I thought, oh, there's a mountain lion watching us. So she calls her daughter back and then she goes back in. And then she's like, it always stuck in my mind. And then she mentioned it to like the FBI when he was arrested. And he had this coded diary that he wrote in. And he wrote in at that time that he saw her scattering these seeds and then the little girl, and he had a gun on her. He had a gun trained on the little girl. And he was like, I, he said, uh, I could have I could have killed the little bitch, is what he said. Um, but but then the, what was it? Yeah, I could have uh, taken the little bitch out, but then the big bitch might get away. So he, this whole thing about like, I just hate technology and hate and be like, well, what is that little girl playing in some trees? Like, he ju- is just a twat of the highest he's order. He's just a horrible man. He's and horrible. And he's, he's, he's pushing, espousing these views, which I, do, I think he does believe, but like he's hiding behind them because he's a nihilist. Absolutely. He also, because he was fed up of sort of industrial and real estate development near his home, he was influenced by an, an anarchist philosopher called Jacques Ellou. Mm. Uh, he began vandalising construction sites yeah. near, near his home. And he, he, what, what he was angry about, mostly... He said that humans were being led, led away from nature and towards surrogate activities like popular entertainment and sport. And he was trying to urge humans to return to wild nature. And this is why he wrote his manifesto. Yes. Which we'll get to. He he destroyed lots of things. He was uh, So he poured sand in the sawmill of Butch Gehrings. And so it went through the system and it broke every single part of it. And it cost loads of money to repair. But they never suspected it was... Well, they were like, maybe it's Ted because he hates, he, he, they had a real sort of, they hated each other. But it was like, it could be anyone. They thought maybe it was kids. There was also a cabin near his where some people used to go along the track that you're not meant to go along on motorbikes. And then they would, they had a little cabin there. And when they were away from it, he took an axe to it and he cut a hole, he, he smashed through the side of the building. And then he, took a monkey wrench and he smashed up everything inside the building and he picked a monkey wrench because he was like everyone in the area has a monkey wrench so it's not you know if they find one it's no big deal and then he shat in the bath no need for that (laughs) (laughs) which part you know what that is though go on that's adrenaline you know it's very common in house break-ins that uh they will shit in the bath or they will shit in the house because when someone breaks into your house they get this rush of adrenaline and they're like oh I need to have a shit and they'll often just do it wherever it's fucking insane do you know what my grandma would have called him go on a destructive little madam because <laughs> that's what she used to call if we did anything remotely you know if you just knock something up you destructive little madam <laughs> That's what he is. Well, he um, he is interviewed by the police about this crime, about this destruction. What, and is this like, yours? Yeah. <laughs> and he's like, what did you have to eat? Have you had sweet corn recently? Um, <laughs> Lots of nuts and berries in it. <laughs> I think it's dead. <laughs> and he was like, no, gosh, that's awful. Like, I can't think who would have done it. And they asked the neighbours specifically, they said... What about this Ted guy? He's a bit weird. And they said, you know what? He is weird, but he wouldn't do anything like this. And it was it was the neighbours vouching for him that meant that he wasn't on the police's radar, which is an interesting thing because with lots of serial killers, you find that they have been on the police's radar before for various other things, mm-hmm. but he was just completely yeah. unknown. There was no real police contact other than this prior to him being arrested for the crimes. There is there is a period as well. So he, he starts making these bombs in uh, his shed and they're very sort of crude. He uses for, for like dynamite to make them explosive, he uses match heads. So we're talking about very low powered bombs. They're always in a wooden casing. That's sort of a, a signature of his. Um, but at some point he starts to get hold of very explosive um like materials like actual sort of bomb making stuff and this is in the because he goes through state does does some bombs and then they think he's in jail because he goes quiet for about seven years and yeah then he's he quiet again. for ages yeah. doesn't it? so in the bit where he's quiet the neighbors start hearing every now and then massive explosions that like shake the mountain and they're like 
oh, someone must be, you know, like quarrying or something. And they never suspect that it's Ted and like all living that time. near Yosemite Sam or something. <laughs> yeah. But they never, they never clock that it was Ted. He was experimenting and he was making bigger, bigger explosions because he got so frustrated that the bombs that he was sending weren't killing anyone. And that was his aim, which is Absolutely. horrific. So that's his sort of childhood and the cabin years um, leading. <laughs> and now, uh, we'll, should we do the next episode about the bombs? We'll do the bombs next. That episode will be the bomb. You're welcome. Well, <laughs> oh, it'll be several dear. bombs. Thank you for listening. Tickets for our 10 year anniversary tour woo woo. Uh, on sale now. Mm-hmm. Not many left. Allkillinoldfiller.com. You can get tickets from there. We're starting Glasgow in March. Yes, in a massive venue, but it's selling brilliant. We've gone yeah. into some really huge venues like Cardiff and uh, Leeds, Leeds have already sold out, and Norwich has oh, got was Leeds sold out already. Yeah, yeah. Oh, lovely. S- S- Leeds first sell out. We love Leeds. Um, don't know why I did that. Uh, <laughs> I did a peace sign if you're listening, um, and feel thoroughly ashamed. You see your Ringo and I'm. Oh, yeah, because oh. you love a thumbs up. <laughs> oh, no, that. my Ringo. Ringo's oh, nice. God. No, behave. No, no one's like, God, I just want to be Ringo when I'm older. I mean, actually, yeah, you're the most famous band in the world and you fuck a Bond girl. It's all right, isn't it? Um, my two favourite things I want from 2024, I'm manifesting. Um, you, you can also get merch. Yes, there's from merch. From allchillinoffiller.com. Tickets are on sale. Mm-hmm. Not many left. Be quick if you want to join yes. us. Your tour is on sale. Also, we've gone into some very big venues. And so the plan was for us was to like, oh, we'll sell the stalls out and hopefully the next level. But we're going into the like third level that we never expected to, which is absolutely amazing. So I think we'd have it, that's happening for Manchester and Glasgow and things like that. Hackney so thank Empire. you so much. Hackney Empire. Yeah, we're right in the in the gods, which is so lovely. Um, yeah, we're really excited. Yes. My tour is on sale. I start in May at the McIntyre Comedy Festival. A couple of dates sold out already which is lovely. Thank you to Chester. Thank you to Manchester. There's another Manchester date in a very exciting venue going to be announced soon. It's been confirmed. I've, I've nothing to report. <laughs> I, I've done. Done for the year. I'm 2024. Working. No, you're doing a new show, aren't you? I'm working on a new show. My partner's really excited about it. Uh, I'm working on a new show, but I, I'm doing a preview in Leicester, which I think's nearly sold out. The Manchester one's sold out. No fucking pressure now. Time's creeping up. I thought I've got plenty of time. I've not. <laughs> uh, but, yeah. But that's all I've got. Nothing to say. There's nothing. Just this. Nothing. Just this. To be honest, I'm quite happy. She gestured at me then. Just <laughs> this. No, I'm quite happy to just have a few weeks of just, you know. Mate, you've been constantly working. on tour for two years. I've not been home since the 19th of December. I've mentioned this. I thought you were going to say since 1994. <laughs> well, that's what I feel like. I, you, I'm like scared of going home. I always have these. you ever away from home for so long that you have these thoughts in your head that moths have taken over the whole house? No, I have a thing that like there'll be a man in my house. That's what I always think. Things. Well, like, you said moth, Rachel. Yeah, a moth man. A mo- <laughs> <laughs> the moth man will be living in my house. Um, and to the point where I'll sometimes film as I come in the house. Really? Yeah, yeah. I remember one Christmas I came back from wherever I'd been and I came back and the oven was warm. And I was like, oh, my God, someone's been living in my house over Christmas. Can't be doing this. Um, And I just realised that I just left the oven on. (laughs) (laughs) Lovely way to end things. Um, Thanks so much for listening, for watching. Um, We will see you back with part two of the Unabomber.